This is NHI Notables with Ernesto Nieto. Hello, this is Ernesto Nieto, and welcome to the second installment on the discussion of NHI Notables, where we talk with friends, associates, fellow employees about a number of topics of relevance to the work of the National Hispanic Institute and of specific relevance to the Latino community. I want to welcome Paula Hernandez, a longtime friend from El Paso, and just begin with the first question. Paula, tell us a little bit about how you first got involved with the National Hispanic Institute. What were the high school programs? Why did you go? What motivated you? Why did you do it? So, hi, Ernie. Thank you. Um, I first got involved in NHI or with NHI uh, because I was I was uh, a freshman at Loretto Academy uh, who didn't really speak English very well, uh, but I liked arguing, so I was in debate team. And so a couple of friends from the debate team uh, invited me to a meeting, and uh, they were talking about this organization that they belonged to that I needed to belong to if I wanted to be anyone um, in the future. And so they invited me to literally, quote unquote, be the future of the Latino community. And that's how they, <laughs> that's how they put it. Uh, so they invited me to a meeting at Cathedral High School where I took my parents. Uh, they did not understand both a single, both parents. They, uh, did not understand a single thing that was said because the meeting was entirely in English and my parents to this day do not speak very well. Was, was there an NHI English. represent with their yes. local parents? So we had, we had a local parent who was our project administrator at the time, Ms. Marisa Barrios, and we had other NHI students who were speaking. Okay. Um, and at the end, I told my parents that that's what I wanted to do and that I needed them to sign me up. And my dad was like, are you sure? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't sound too exciting. And I was like, no, that, that's what I want to do, dad. And so he signed me up and, um, I participated in the 20, uh, the 2007 YLC, which is now the great debate. You're dating yourself. So be careful. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's been 11 years. Uh, and the 2007 YLC, um, in Austin College at Sherman, Texas. And I was. Now, was it of, called the YLC? The young it was, Yes, it, it was, was part back of, then. It was the old uh-huh. name. Okay. It was part. It was uh, called the YLC, and uh, I was part of the El Paso region, which was super exciting. Um, and and I think it was the first time that I really felt like I was part of El Paso. Before I always felt like I was a Juarez girl in El Paso, but um, that was the first time that I felt like I was part of the community of El Paso. You bring you bring to to light an interesting word. What is a girl? Can, can you describe that for a moment so I can know what, what you mean by that? <laughs> uh, so growing up in the border is, is kind of an interesting thing. Um, I, was, I was driving here and I was kind of thinking of how I look at things, right? And so I, I always saw myself as a very like temper, temporary person and things in my life were always very temporary, right? My, my mom's family was from Durango, and then they moved to, to Juarez. And then my family moved to El Paso. And then my family, you know, kind of like always toured around with the idea of moving other places. And so the one place that I could always go back to was Juarez. I was born in Juarez. I grew up in Juarez. My mom was from Juarez. My dad was from Juarez. My abuelitos lived in Juarez. My friends lived in Juarez. So it was the one city that kind of connected us all. So is it more a location than a stigma? Oh, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see a stigma at all. It's more of, of the one place that I could connect with my parents, with my grandparents, with my friends. Um, and it was the one place that, that was home. So if someone says, I'm a what is girl or what is guy versus an El Paso person, what does that mean? Um, it means that maybe what is it means you speak better Spanish? No, <laughs> no I think that it, it means that you see Juarez as an integral part of who you are. Okay. Um, a lot of people, you know, yeah, they, they have family that's from the border, but they all in all are from El Paso, went to Juarez to go visit, um, but never really had the opportunity to live there, grow up there, go to school there, um, which was something that I did. Now, the the revolving secret around this organization is that you never went to the LDZ. No, I never went to the LDZ or, or the to the CBS, which I confessed finally. So are you an orphan child? <laughs> I am. Point? I am. Um, uh, 
I'm a half NHI. You're half NHI. I'm a half blood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what is that? Wh why is it that you didn't end up going to these other uh, two So that's actually, that's, mommy, I'm sorry. I got into a lot of trouble before my LDZ. So my mom knew to hit me where it hurt. And the one place that she could ground me um, and she could really give it to me and, and kind of um, get you. back at me and show me was NHI. And so she didn't let me go to the LDZ. And so you became a junior counselor for the first time in your life and a coach. Or uh -huh. did you? No, I did. I, I uh, stayed involved and I coached all throughout the Great Debate and YLC until I graduated high school. And then the summer I graduated, um, Mac Peña and Gabby Morales gave me a call and they said, we need you at the Big Bend Great Debate oh, that one. in Alpine. Um, and so that was my first program outside of the four-day format. Um, and so I became a head coach for that. And then the summer after that, um, they gave me a call and we said, hey, we need a girl from the El Paso area to go be a head coach or a, a senior counselor at the Colorado LDZ. Are you interested? I said, I've never done it. They said, you're fine. You'll be fine. You'll learn. So one day I'm standing outside um, Our Lady of the Lake University and I had just gone by to get some hamburgers <laughs> for some staff. And... I saw you and I asked you if you would ever consider working for the National Hispanic Institute. Yeah. And you said, I'm ready right now. Yeah. Well, what, without getting personal, just ideologically or philosophically or job station wise, <clears throat> what made you, what was the influence that said, I want to go work for this organization? Um, I think NHI is the first place where I felt like I belonged and all of me belonged. The nice parts, the pretty parts, the bad parts, the the not, you know, so so nice parts, the um, Juarez part, the El Paso part, the part that didn't speak English very well. Um, and, and I felt like I belonged, and that that became home. And so, can you time, expound on that? Just a, what does belong mean? Um, I think that. It was the, the one place, the one surrounding the people uh, of NHI were, were the place or the people that I could breathe deeply with and be myself. Does common cause mean anything to Absolutely. You? I think common cause means something. I think common experience means shared something. Shared values. Shared values. And, and the, just the fact that we are thinking about values and the fact that we are thinking about what is our legacy going to be? And the fact that we are thinking about um, permanence and, and building something, that's, that's not something that you do with, you know, regular people. jobs. Mm -hmm. And so, and so were those the reasons in your view that led you to that decision? I want more of this. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, I think that for most people, uh, you get to experience NHI and then you get, you develop a craving for it and then you develop a hunger for it. So you want more and you want more. And so when the opportunity is presented, uh, I don't know anyone in this organization who would say no. Um, what were, what did you realize once here, once locked in with other staff, <laughs> what, what, what conclusions or what observations did you come to about the nature of the work as understood from the outside and the real nature of the work as understood from the inside? Um, I, I think that I always, you know, understood that we were all in this together and that there was a bigger, um, you know, a bigger cost and that a lot of people were working towards one same goal, right? Whether it's a PA, a volunteer, a parent, um, anyone from, from outside in the community. But at the end of the day, the five, six people uh, who are locked in, you know, the annex or in the mansion in Maxwell, Texas, uh, are the people who are living, breathing, eating, sleeping NHI. And um, it's those people that it's literal blood, sweat, tears every day. Uh, there is no stopping. In the outside world, you get to take a little bit of a, of a breath. You get to decompress from NHI. You know, you get home from a program and you get to sleep for 10 hours straight. And you don't get to do that when you're, when you're working here. Well, in your view, what is NHI teaching? It's youth. I think we are alerting them of the fact that A, they have a voice, 
that B, that voice is powerful, that C, that voice can move agendas, um, and that they need to start thinking about what that powerful voice and that ability to move an agenda is going to mean for the future. And that if they're not thinking about that, they're, they're at a disadvantage because the rest of the world is. Um, so it, it really wakes people up to doing and thinking and believing and working towards something. What are your parents' attitudes now versus <laughs> their attitudes five years ago? Um, to, I mean, to be quite fair, my dad barely realizes like what I'm doing. My dad <laughs> barely figured out like what I'm doing. What is NHI about a year ago? He still, he still has question marks. Yeah, no, 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 his questions have been answered. But up until about a year, two years ago, my dad still had no idea what NHI was. Um, after you know, ten years of me being involved with the institute, but. My mom loves the fact that she sees my eyes sparkle anytime I'm around NHI, every time I talk about NHI. Um, I, I never stop. And so I think that as any mother I would like for her children, my mom has seen that I found what I love and the place that I that I feel like I belong. So she she loves that and she's very proud of that. Um, my dad is a little bit more uh, corporate and, and how he manages his his beliefs and his time. Um, so I'm sure he would like for me to be you know, working at a bank making seven figures. But um. So he associates work with profits. Yes. And, that and is, material gains and things like that. Nature. Yes. Um, I think that his understanding of, of work is more in a, yeah, in, in a profit-driven, um, I guess, understanding rather than, than the legacy, or do you enjoy what you do every day? Do you? This past weekend, you are with a rather relatively large size of young people, not too much younger than you, mm -hmm. uh, who are seen as faculty roles, who are seen as youth mentors, who are seen. What do you see different about them today and peers when you went through the program? Uh, they have a lot more access. They have a lot more access to NHIHQ, to knowledge, to um, you, to uh, just understanding um, the mission of the Institute, whether that's because of technology or social media. They have a lot more access to each other also. Um, they never stop talking. They're always constantly communicating. And they're also a lot more collaborative because of that, because they're they're, they're not always, as they're not as rival driven. Oh no 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 no! I mean they they've learned from day one that they can constantly communicate and constantly learn from one across another. Across state lines, across, across communities, mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, uh, what do you hear differently from them that maybe you didn't hear from earlier groups? Um, they're interested in in the collaboration aspect. They're interesting in building or they're interested in building the institute and their respective regions and creating institutions out of their respective alliances. So when we talk about advancing the intellectual equity of the Latino community, how do you interpret that? I think that in terms of our work? Yes, in or, terms of okay. our work. So in terms of our work... Um, we are, again, alerting young Latinos and Latinas to the fact that they can build institutions and we're training them on organizational development and management. Um, and so they're getting firsthand experience in how to build, develop an alliance, an organization, how to train others, how to mobilize, um, how to create agendas. And so that is knowledge that we as a community don't typically possess and that our kids don't don't know, um, except for when you're in NHI, when you get access to it and, and firsthand knowledge and practice of it. Who, who do you foresee, if, if I were to ask you, pick five NHIers that you foresee... <laughs> That's an unfair question. ...change in okay. the world. Who would those be? NHIers younger than me, older than me. I didn't put an age limit on it. Ooh, um that in your view are developing, evolving, powerful, influential voices? Oh, this, is, this is an unfair question. Um, 
I'm going to go younger and then older and then around the same age. Um, I think Alexandre Ocasio. No, 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 I know. I think that Alex Ocasio um, is a powerful, amazing, just badass woman <laughs> um, that is that is just such an inspirational figure I mean, with the powerful greatest standards figure. in the world, you know, with with great standards and great values. Well, uh, yeah, no, she she cares about people. She cares about people, and she cares about her community. Okay. And I think that that is. I think you would find a lot of agreement there. Mm -hmm. Who's number two? Um, oh, Ernie, uh, I think people like Nicholas Zabrowski are very valuable to this organization, and, and just to his community. I think that Nick is has got a good heart and one of the brightest minds I know. I might be biased. He's one of my, you know, childhood NHI friends. Um, but but I think that Nick is is change the world worthy. Okay. Um, I think got three more to go. <laughs> on a younger generation and again, um, I might be biased. Um, yeah, I think But of course it's all biased. I know, I know, and, and I was, you know, I, I worked with them. Uh, I think people like Mercedes uh, Munoz, yes. who's now a student at Boston University, originally from El Paso, um, is just such a bright mind, um, and she cares, and she dedicates herself. And, and I mean, if I had to, again, she is the 2.0 version of all of us El Paso girls, right? She's smart, she's pretty, she's talented, she's dedicated, she's got grit, um, and, and so, I mean, I, I can only imagine what Mercedes is going to do. Um, fourth, uh, I think in this organization and not only because he's sitting next to me, um, I think that Julio, and when I say Julio, Julio Cotto, uh, is someone that through his work with the organization, is going to impact so I many lives. I know this lives. is not a paid political. <laughs> no, it, it's going to Im impact so many lives that that you you change. The, there's no other way around it. You change the world when you change that many lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that he is deeply analytical, and I think that he is deeply uh, involved in the work that we carry out, not only here but abroad. Um, and so, so that answers that um, spot and finally um, I would say that if I had to pick another NHR who is just a machine um, and, and I'm just so impressed by him and his duality of, of language and his ability to get things done and sometimes you know he's a little too fast or, or kind of a maverick um, a Louis Tijerina uh, I think that Louis Tijerina is just a go-getter. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, he didn't speak Spanish. That never stopped him. He learned. He moved to a different city, started a new region. Um, he jumped onto a field that he, you know, had no experience in and now is a fantastic broker. Um, I, I don't think that there's any stopping Louis. And just by sheer dedication and sheer just, again, grit, um, Louis is just bound to do amazing things. As an organization, as we continue getting older and more mature and more well-known, I hope, what do you think are going to be the challenges that, that we're going to have to prepare for? Uh, given the fact that we live, for example, in a Trump era, given the fact that we live in a country that um, is kind of concerned about losing their status, I'm talking about the white community, mm -hmm. Uh, concern that they will become less in numbers and maybe not as influential. Uh, concerned about uh, the the importing of other religious beliefs and can, and that shakes the roots of the Christian outlooks. Where where do you think we are headed as a society? And then the secondary question is, where should NHI play a role in that? Okay, um, I think that our community is has been put in the spotlight, right? And um, it, it has two options, to either react um, to hate with hate and, and to be loud and boisterous and, and angry um, and respond with anger and, and react to a community and to a country that has made it very clear that it sees us all under one blanket 
um, you know, terminology, whether that's illegal or not American or, or whatever, you know, bad hombres, whatever it is. Um, I think that this country has made it very clear that Latinos are being looked at with a very cautious eye and that they don't trust us and that they don't trust our intentions um, or they don't even believe us to be part of this this community. And I think that Latinos can either react by getting angry and yelling and organizing, you know, to to protest, or they can be very smart about their influencing of, of their kids. I think that um, Latinos should, and the Latino community should prepare its younger generations to be kind and be smart and be um, so well prepared to guide their communities and to guide uh, the educational system and to position themselves in in positions of power or as community leaders so that there can be more knowledge or more access. I think that maybe the Trump era has been born because people fear the unknown. And when you don't know what the Latino community is all about and when you've never been exposed to it, then you fear it. Um, but as Latinos grow more and more in their, in their you know, positions or in just population numbers, um, we have the opportunity to teach our kids to be smart and be prepared and be um, kind and push forward agendas that will help our community but will help the United States. And where do you see NHI having to improve uh, in order to, for it to increase its presence? increases effectiveness, and increases influence. What, what, what would you say to the board of directors, the board of trustees? These are the areas of improvement that I think would make NHI um, better than it has been, better than it is expected to be, and better than it should be. Uh, and it, there's a lot of brain trust and, and brain power within the organization. And I don't know that we've ever exploited or, or put to use any of that that brain power um, within our membership. Um, I think that as we grow and, and as we move into the future, we need to engage a lot of our members uh, more in not only <coughs> themes and topics and, and programming summer-wise, uh, but to develop um, new avenues for revenue for the organization. We need to uh, you know start thinking beyond the the confines of Maxwell, Texas, and, and we're going to have to start uh, doing a lot more work throughout this, country, uh, throughout this country, throughout Latin America, and so we need to start engaging as many people as possible and start bringing on as many partners as possible, and uh, I think that that's somewhere where the board of directors can really help uh, kind of take the organization. In your view, are we ahead or in keeping pace, or are we the innovators who are we and the future of the Latino community? We are the agenda makers. We are the innovators. Um, we are, we have the supply of brain power that this that this country needs, um, and we have ninety thousand members. Uh, that 100, are a hundred thousand. Are we are we moving out? Okay, a hundred thousand members yeah. that that are ready to go and and take the world on. Um, if they are being united by a common cause or by a common set of beliefs. If you were a Jenny, and this is the final question, okay. and you could explain to a child who is five years old that 20 years from now, by the time that person is 25 years old, uh, this is what NHI will look like. What do you perceive NHI looking like 25 years from now, 20 years from now? NHI is going to be so deeply entrenched in um, how we learn, how we gain uh, access to knowledge, how we uh, operate civically, um, how we open up businesses. It's going to be part of their every day, whether it's NHI-owned businesses, not by the organization, but by NHIers. Um, whether it's that they learned through NHI principles and ideal is has been institutionalized in their in their learning environments, um, 
whether they assess every single problem and or issue and or challenge with an IBL mentality, it's going to be so deeply entrenched in their lives in every aspect of their lives um, that it's going to be the norm. NHI is where they get their news. NHI is where they read um, their books. NHI is where they send their kids to school. NHI is where they operate and do business with. Um, and by NHI, I mean NHIers. Well, Paula, it's always enjoyable visiting with you. This is the first time I've ever had this kind of conversation with you <laughs> outside of our office. I, I want to uh, thank you for your time and uh, joining us on these initial discussions that we're having called NHI Notables. You guys have a good time out in the world today. Good night. Thanks, Ernie. For more information on the National Hispanic Institute, please visit our website, www dot national hispanic institute dot org call us at 512-357-6137 find us on facebook at nhihq or on twitter nhi underscore news and at instagram and snapchat nhi underscore news